what I want to do is I want to pick up reading in Romans 10, verse 16, and then we'll continue through Romans 11, verses 1 through 7. So look in Romans 10, and I do have one more handout up there if anybody does want it. Uh, Romans 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went throughout all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. He's talking about us, by the way, Gentiles. But Isaiah uh, is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, all the day long, all, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Verse 1 of chapter 11. I say then, this is Paul speaking, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What? Ye, what ye not that the, what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh, talking about Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, uh, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and digged down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Who's he talking about there? What person is he talking about? The guy in the cave that yep. he still small voice, Jeremiah. Elijah. Talking about Elijah. Remember when Elijah's over there in the cave, he just brought down the, the fire on Mount Carmel. It consumed the sacrifices. They killed 450 prophets of Baal by cutting their heads off. Pour it down the brook uh, Sidron there, I believe. And uh, then in chapter 19, Jezebel says, uh, I'm going to uh, kill, uh, basically I'm going to kill Elijah the same way he killed my prophets. In chapter 19, uh, Elijah goes and flees to a cave. He's suicidal, depressed, not eating, hiding, uh, isolates himself from everybody else, says it'd be better for him to die, says he's not as good as his father, so on and so forth. The angel comes there and feeds him bread. And uh, Elijah says to God, he says, I only am serving the Lord. And he said, they, they want to kill me. And he said, there's no one else serving the Lord with me. He was a preacher. He's a prophet. He just saw God bring down fire from heaven in front of a whole thousands of people. Thousands of people saw this. He brings down fire from heaven. Um, thousands of people see it. It consumes the sacrifices there. The false prophets of Baal, they cannot bring down fire. So basically... God wins, and they go, and Elijah goes and cuts off all the prophets uh, Baal's heads. Uh, Israel helps him, of course, I'm sure. And uh, the next chapter, he's in depression. He went from a great high to a great low. And it was because somebody didn't like what he was doing. And also, the people weren't behind him fully. Now, you can debate on whether or not, we'll get into all this, but whether or not the people are with, you with him or not, I don't know, because if you all helped me cut off 450 prophets' heads, I think you were all with me. But Elijah, for some reason, the devil got in his head and he thought, no one else is with me. No one's on my side. No one cares about me. No one believes in me. No one believes the way that I do. It's just me. Even though they just helped him cut 450 prophets of Baal's heads off, he thinks it's all him. And then look what happens. This is all back in 1 Kings 19, but look what it, he summarizes it here. Verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? This is what God says to Elijah. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Look in verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So, um, three big things here in, chapters, uh, in chapter 11 that Paul's going to bring up. He's going to bring up the doctrine of the remnant. The doctrine of the remnant. Bring this closer to y'all. The doctrine of the remnant. And this is going to be an important doctrine because he's going to actually spend the whole chapter talking about it. Uh, so it's important for us to know what that is. The doctrine of the remnant. If you had to give a, an overview to chapter 11, Paul's going to explain why Israel is blind. That he says to there are some that are elect. And uh, talking about there are some people that obeyed God and there's another part of Israel that is blinded to the truth. And we talked about how God can blind a person to the truth of the word of God if they reject him. And he's going to talk about how Jews and Gentiles are differentiated. So he's going to explain the blindness of Israel. And we'll get into this a little bit deeper. He's going to contrast uh, Jews versus Gentiles. And there is a difference and you've got to get the difference. The reason why you have so many different denominations... Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, Church of Christ, Seventh-day Adventist, Catholics, uh, Episcopalian, Apostolic, uh, Church of Christ, Church of God, uh, all those things is because a lot of times if you don't get your Jew right, 
You won't understand the promises to the Jew. And then you'll try to take their promises like speaking in tongues and raising, uh, handling poisonous snakes and not dying from it, thinking that you can heal people by touching them. Those are promises to the Jews. So Paul's going to differentiate between the Jews and the Gentiles. And then a key to understanding this is that he's talking primarily about a nation of people. Because uh, we'll get into it later whenever we read chapter 11 on next week. But uh, he's going to talk about the elect and you know, Pharaoh's heart being hard and different things. But keep in mind, he's going to talk about the nation of Israel and the, the Gentiles as a nation. Now, this doctrine of the remnant is important to understand because you have to, you have to get this in your head. God has always had a people that he favors above other people. Now, I know that's not popular. I know that's not popular in, in, you know, in 2022, but God does have favorites. He only had one son. And he was his favorite son, Jesus Christ. That was, his, that was his elect. That was his favorite son. At one time, he had one man that he called his friend, Abraham. He didn't call anyone else in Abraham's day his friend. Just Abraham was called his friend. The children of Israel. God loved the children of Israel more than he loved the Gentiles. They were his people. He gave them special blessings and promises that he did not give to everybody else. The reason why we, you have to understand the doctrine of the remnant is to, to know that God's always had a people that he identifies as his people. You got to get that down. Throughout all of history, there's always been either a person like Noah and his family. There's always been a, a family, a group of people, several people or a nation or a, a local body of believers. There's always been a group of people where God said, those are my people. And if you don't get that down, you're not going to understand why we do the things that we do. God's people have always been an outcast and an off or a, uh, a weird or strange to the world. If you're going to identify a religion that you say, I believe is the closest to biblical Christianity, then you have to know what the Bible teaches about that group of people. A Christianity where people in the world don't mind it isn't biblical Christianity. Uh, the average religion nowadays, the people don't care if you're a Christian. Because uh, a lot of Christians and a lot of churches are not any different than the world. But the doctrine of the remnant shows that God has a specific group of people that's different than uh, the rest of the world. And you have to know who God approves of and who he doesn't. You have to understand that God approves of one group and not another. What happened back in, the th in around 325 A.D., uh, the church was growing so much. And the uh, Constantine, Emperor and Constantine, uh, the whole Roman Empire was falling. It was tearing apart. And uh, despite they were trying to hold it together, um, the, and uh, what was happening was they kept persecuting, the Catholic Church in Rome kept persecuting Christianity. And Christianity kept growing. They couldn't put it down. With all their war, wars and murderings and everything like that and persecutions, they couldn't put the, the uh, Christians down. So what uh, Constantine did is the council, you had the Council of Nicaea, and then you had the, uh, oh, what's it called, the uh, Edict of Milan, where he basically said it's no longer illegal to be a Christian anymore. In Rome, it was illegal to be a Christian, to identify as a Christ follower. Uh, what Emperor Constantine did was he said, I want to unite Rome under something, and we need to unite it under religion. So what he did was, was all the pagan worship, the sun gods, the moon gods, Ashtar, and all those different people, he made it to where now Christians are no longer illegal. It's no longer illegal to be a Christian. And what he did was he tried combining Roman pagan worship with Christianity. That's why he created holidays. I don't, we're not going to get deep into this right now, but I'm talking about the doctrine of the remnant. There's always been a people that God's identified as his people. Whenever that happened, they said, look, you Christians can come in and worship with us. We worship on, around December 25th. We worship a God and we have a special celebration for him. You can worship Christ's birthday on that day. Even though he wasn't born in December, he's born you know, in the fall. But we can just worship it all together. We'll have a big feast. We'll have a big celebration out in the streets and you can just worship it together. We have, so we, we celebrate Baal, the winter solstice. We celebrate that in the wintertime. Come worship it with us. The Catholic Church said that. What Pergamos means, Pergamos, if you study it out in Revelation, you have the, the different churches. Pergamos was that time period whenever this all happened. Pergamos means marriage, whenever the, the church married up to the world. And what the Catholic Church did was they said, hey, in springtime, we celebrate a goddess named Ashtar, our female deity. Our male de deity is Baal, starting in the Old Testament. Ashtar, we celebrate her in springtime. Flowers and animals are reproducing. You can worship Christ's resurrection around that time. That time period was whenever the world, what happened was the, the, the world said, hey, we can't stop Christians from being Christians. What we can do is, is we can try to mingle them in with us. And we can try to make them act like us and do the things that we do and talk the way that we talk, walk the way that we walk, dress the way that we dress, have the same desires and same motives as them. And that all happened in around 300 and some A.D. And the idea is this. God's always had a group of people that the world despises. 
And if the world does not despise your religion, you don't have a religion of what the Bible teaches. If everyone's okay with your religion at work, then you're not following Christ. If everyone's okay with your religion in your family, if everybody agrees with it and says, oh yeah, that's great and that's wonderful. The average person at work does not care if you're a Christian. They just care if you're a Bible-believing Christian. I got all kinds of co-workers, man. I love them to death. And they're Christians. They're Christians. They're Christians that cuss, that go out and fornicate, that drink, that have dirty, th- dirty jokes, say dirty jokes, that go to a happy hour with the rest of the co-workers. That's not biblical Christianity. That's a Christianity that, that people don't, don't, they don't mind if you're a Christian. The idea that Paul's talking about here is there's a remnant of people. He's talking about the Jews. But there's a remnant of people that God, throughout all the ages, God's always said, those are my people. And if you don't, if you don't believe that, you're going to have trouble understanding church history. We'll eventually go through church history and the different groups and whatnot. Uh, but there's a, there's a line that we followed since the time of Christ. And uh, we'll, we'll eventually go through all that. But you've got to get that because if you don't understand where you came from, you're not going to know why we're doing what we're doing. You're not going to understand why we believe the way that we believe. And it's also going to hurt you whenever you try to understand prophecy as well. If you don't understand what happened in the past, you're not going to understand what's going to happen in the future. So we'll eventually get through all that. But the doctrine of the remnant, it's important to understand church history. It's important for us to not lose hope. Uh, there are more Christians out there. Uh, there are more Christians out there in the world. It's not just us meeting here on Sunday. There are a whole lot of other Christians out there in the world. And usually whenever there's a small minority of God's people, God's usually getting ready to change the way that he works with mankind. Usually whenever God's people get so small, it usually means he's getting ready to change how he uh, works with mankind. I ran some numbers off the other day of how many uh, Christians there are in the world and what denominations they are. there are. This is from 2010. They were stats from 2010. You don't have to write these down or anything, but it's just kind of eye-opening. Uh, in 2010, I believe there were 6.9, yeah, 6.9 billion people in the world. They said around 2.2 million of those um, were Christians. What did I say? Yeah. I said, I meant, yeah, I meant billions. 2.2 billion they identify as Christians. Out of those, I believe it was 1.1 billion or 1.2 billion are Catholic. Catholic. Uh, subtract that. How much is 2.2 billion minus 1.2 billion? One billion. Y'all didn't know we were doing math, did you? Uh, so there's around 1 billion Christians that, are, that don't identify as Catholic. What I did was, uh, that comes down to about 14% of the world. Um, 14% of the world, if you do the math out, uh, are Christians and, and not necessarily Catholics. Come on in. Are Christians, not necessarily Catholics. But, yep, this is what I did. How's it going, my man? Good. Uh, we're just starting here at a lesson in Romans. Good to see you. Um, anyways, do the math down, break it down. I threw in, if you added in Baptists, I added in just... You may not like this. I added in Methodists. Talking about people that you know, could be saved, could believe the gospel. I added in Methodists. I added in a non-denominational. I added in all these people. And then I even added in a quarter of the Catholics saying that they're saved. Again, you don't have to be a Baptist to go to heaven. You don't have to be a Methodist. You don't have to be a Catholic. You don't have to be any. You can be non-denominational. You can be whatever you want. But if you're not trusting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to get you to heaven, you don't go to heaven. So I'm talking about, I know that for the most part, these people preach salvation by grace through faith. These people right here, they throw in a little bit of uh, water, a little bit of water salvation, non-denominational. They, they may preach the gospel. Uh, churches that don't identify as a denomination. I put uh, one quarter of Catholics, 250 million of them. Um, I put in one, maybe they're saved. Maybe there really are 250 million Catholics that are trusting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to save their souls. They're not relying on their prayer life. They're not relying on tithes and offerings. They're not relying on confession to a priest. They're not relying on water baptism. They're just relying on Jesus Christ to save them. If you do the math and break it all down, I came out to around 530 million people in the world might be saved. And that's around 8% of the population. And that was in 2010... Uh, around 2010, those numbers, so it's probably even less now. Think of this. So 8% of the population might be saved. How many of them are actually separated from the world and living a life consecrated to Jesus Christ? I'd say even less. I didn't run the numbers on it. You say, Aaron, what's your point? This is how many people you have in the world that are on your side. Much less than this. I'm talking about maybe 1%, 2% of the population of the whole world is actually saved, on their way to heaven, knows that they're saved, and are actually living a life for Jesus Christ. 
being a remnant and being a minority is nothing new for God's people. And what you have happening all over is you have people that are saying, look, people don't want to come to church anymore. They don't want to go to a church where there's preaching and teaching. They don't want to, you know, you got to change things up to get people to come, this, that, and the other. It was never about having a bunch of people. It was never about having a, the pews packed out. It was never about having millions of people in your church or thousands of people in your church. That was ne- the, the early church didn't start that way. God's people, the, Israel, they were always a minority. They never had as many people as other nations had when, when they'd gone to battle. What God likes to do is He likes to use a group of small people to do great things. He likes to use a person without a lot of skill, a lot of talent to do great things. He likes to use a group of people that are meeting. And you know the average person, they'd walk into this church right now and say, man, this church is half empty. Man, I mean, they're not full. They don't have a lot of gimmicks going on. They don't have a lot of different classes and everything for my kids and whatnot. They don't have classes for me. I'm a single guy or a single woman. And they'd walk out and they'd go to a place where it's more, more full. Instead of realizing this, it might be that there are fewer people here. Because usually, nine times out of ten, Jesus Christ said, uh, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be that go in thereat. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that go in thereat. But he says that the way to heaven, the way to truth, he says it's narrow. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it, Jesus said. Meaning there's going to be a lot fewer people that actually get to heaven. than, uh, than, uh, than the, There's going to be a lot fewer people that get to heaven and that are also living for God. So you've got to get that the doctrine of the remnant is nothing new. And that's what Paul's trying to teach here in Romans 11. Uh, so don't let that discourage you. Uh, we, we have goals here to grow and everything in number, but uh, the idea is don't let that discourage you. God likes using a small group of people to do uh, big things. Now, uh, i got 19 minutes. Let me try to get through this quickly. I don't want to lose you. Um, but what I'm going to do here, uh, if you can, I'm getting ready to give you a bunch of information. Okay? Don't try to write it all down. Go back and listen to it. I have the notes written out there. Do this. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bunch of deep information that's going to go over a lot of your heads. It went over my head the first time I heard it. I'm going to give you the main chapters that you can write down, and you can go back and read those on your own. Don't try to fully understand it. Go back and read this on your own, the stuff I'm getting ready to give you. Because my goal is that I want to give you a little bit deeper material, and then I'm going to give you some practical more milk at the end. Um, but Paul here, so Paul said in Romans 11, look down in Romans 11 verse 1. Romans 11, 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So, Paul here is saying, is God done with Israel? He's saying, no, he has not cast them aside. Paul says, look, I'm here. I'm a Jew. And God's using me. He says, for I am an Israelite. He's saying, God's not completely done with the Jews. I'm still here. Paul's looking around saying, no, I mean, he's not done with us because he's still using me. Paul's a type of the Jew, the Jewish remnant, that will be saved during the tribulation. Paul is a type of a Jew that will, uh, uh, he is, Paul is a type, so a picture, of the Jew during the tribulation. Now we've gone through this before, but for those of you, I'll just draw it out quickly. You have Calvary right here, you have the Old Testament, you have Calvary, you have the New Testament. Oh, I did that backwards. New Testament. This is the church age. This has gone on for around 2,000 years. There's going to be around a seven year, uh, most people believe it's seven years. That's a conversation for another day. Most people believe it will be a seven year tribulation called trib. And then the millennial reign of Christ. And you say, Aaron, I don't know what any of that means. Well, just listen, hang around long enough and you'll hear these words and then you'll you'll get to know what they mean. The The church age is getting ready to end any day now. We're getting ready to go up, uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4. Uh, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, uh, and the, the saints are going up, the rapture of the church. We're going to go up and meet him in the air, meet him in the clouds. Uh, the church is going to leave, and this is where the Antichrist comes in. And a whole lot of things happen, and you can read the book of Revelation. Revelation lays a lot of it out. Daniel lays a lot of it out. Uh, and a lot of your Old Testament saints uh, label it out, or draw it out. During this time period, salvation is different. It's not the same as how we get saved now. Old Testament, they brought animal sacrifices, killed them, laid them on an altar. Do you all bring animal sacrifices on an altar and slay it and pour its blood out? Has anybody done that recently? I just want to know just in case. No? Okay. No, we don't do that now. Now, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works. <laughs> Pouring the blood out, you know, doing all the different works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2.8. It's a New Testament. We're going to be raptured up. We're going to be taken out. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 
when this happens, the church is gone. Salvation is going to go, uh, it's going to be different. And God's going to start dealing again with the Jews. Right now he's dealing with Gentiles, which is what Paul talked about in Romans 10 and 11. Right now God said, Jews, you rejected me. The Jews rejected Jesus at Calvary. Uh, we'll go through that too. Um, so God's dealing with Gentiles right now. And then whenever, uh, so you have Jews, Old Testament. They were his chosen people. You have Gentiles in the whole world, really. God still loves the Jews, but uh, really the whole world. And then right here, he's going to go back to dealing primarily with the Jews. And Paul is a type of the Jewish remnant that's going to be saved during the tribulation. The Jews are going to be killed off so much. You're on the, the world's population is going to go down during the tribulation. There's going to be wars and famines. Um, and then the Jews are going to be hunted by the Antichrist, killed, and different things. Um, but Paul's a type of the Jewish remnant that will be saved. Think of this. These are just different ways that Paul's a type of the Jew during the tribulation. Paul persecuted the Lord and rejected him before his conversion. He persecuted the Lord and rejected him before his conversion. The, cat, or the, the Jews during the tribulation, they are going to accept the Antichrist to make a covenant with him. They are going to reject God and accept the Antichrist during the tribulation. Then once the Antichrist has you know, full control, we've made that covenant, he's going to go back on that covenant. He's going to begin killing them. And they're going to realize what happened and say, oops, this was the wrong Messiah. This is not the one that we wanted. They're going to flee to the mountains into the wilderness. Uh, uh, so they realize they're falling. They're going to run to the hills. That's in Matthew 24. Uh, Paul gets saved. Where did he go? After Paul gets saved in Acts chapter 9, where does he go? What place does he go to for three years? Mount Sinai. He goes to a desert place, right? Or a mountain. You know how long he's there for? Three years. The Jew, where does a Jew run whenever the abomination of desolation goes back on his covenant? Where does a Jew run? He runs. He flees to the wilderness or to a mountain uh, after uh, he, he rejects God. Uh, so Paul, after he gets saved, he goes to a desert. Uh, for three years, the Jew runs after he realizes that he made their own covenant with the Antichrist. He's going to run to the wilderness. Guess how long they're there for? Around three years. And we'll eventually get into all scenario, get through Revelation. Paul believes on Jesus Christ by sight in Acts chapter 9. It says that he saw him. It blinded his eyes. He saw Christ. The Jews during the trib will get a literal physical appearance of Jesus Christ. You and I, 1 Peter says this, and I have all these verses written down, so you don't have to try to write all these down, but uh, you and I believe on Jesus Christ by faith right now. We've never seen him, but we love him, 1 Peter talks about. Paul saw Jesus Christ, and the, the, the Jew will see Jesus Christ. Um, does anyone know how many days after Paul's revelation of Jesus he was baptized in a water? Anybody know how many days it says in Acts 9? Three days. Three days. Daniel's 70th week, seven days. Days uh, refer to uh, years. Does anybody know how many years the Jews are going to run after they... Um, does anyone know how many years uh, it'll be when our Jesus Christ finally shows up and delivers the Jews? After, they, after, they, after the Antichrist breaks his covenant there... Um, how many years goes by until the tribulation's over? Three. Around three, three and a half, depending on who you, <laughs> who you study after. So and it's not the exact same timeline, but it's similar. And I'm trying to get you to see that Paul's an example of a Jew during the tribulation. Uh, some of you are looking at me going, Aaron, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, the, the, he receives a personal appearance from God, Paul does. The Jews are going to receive a personal appearance from God during the tribulation. Look over in, let's just start, look over in Revelation chapter uh, 6. Look over in Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. Now hang with me. Look over in Revelation chapter 6. Paul is an example of the Jew during the tribulation. Revelation chapter 6, the last book there in your Bible. Revelation 6, uh, look down there in verse number 1. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. This is during the tribulation. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, uh, and him that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. We won't go through who that white horse is, but I don't believe it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but you see that he is conquering, and uh, con he's conquered and conquering, it says. He's killing. 
He's killing. Whoever is on that white horse, he's killing. But I don't believe it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and I'll give you reasons why another day. But Verse 3, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard in the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So you have a red horse. How many of y'all have heard of the four horsemen? How many of y'all heard of four horsemen? How many of y'all have ever heard of the five horsemen? Not even you? Oh, okay. Uh, red, war, destruction. Yeah, the white horse, red horse, this is all stuff during the trib. Verse 5, when he had opened the third seal, I heard the, uh, the third beast say, Come and see, and behold, and lo, a black horse, and him that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. What that's saying is, is that there's going to be famine. The black horse means famine. Uh, you're going to have shortages out in crops. Crops are going to fail. Uh, the price of barley and everything has skyrocketed. Uh, gas will be $50 a gallon. Uh, the thing of bread, excuse me, the thing of bread will be $50 a loaf. Uh, there's going to be famine in the land. And then there's a fourth beast. And looked, and behold, verse 8, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. So you have a pale horse here. Um, oh, that's ugly, ain't it? Death. And it was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So more killing, more destruction. This all happens during the tribulation. These things are going to come in. This is a vision that John saw. Look what happens in chapter 7, verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given uh, to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Don't hurt anybody until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel. There is your 144,000. And he says, don't go and destroy yet until we have marked in their foreheads. Where does the Antichrist mark his believers? Foreheads and in their hand. You say, Aaron, is it a chip? No, it's a mark. Aaron, is it a shot in the arm? No, it's a mark. You say, Aaron, is it, a, is it the barcode? No, it's, it's going to be a physical mark that you're going to be able to see and identify. The Antichrist counterfeits, every, Satan counterfeits everything that God does. God has a church, Satan has a church. God has power, Satan has power. God can speak to you into your heart, Satan can speak to you in your heart. God has Bible teachers and preachers, Satan has Bible teachers and preachers. He counterfeits everything. Uh, and the, the Antichrist is going to counterfeit God and he's going to have a mark. For his people, Antichrist will. But these are God's people. These are the Jews. This is the Jewish remnant in the tribulation that he's going to mark. Notice he said, don't kill yet until we go and mark them in their foreheads. These four horsemen. Now, I challenge you to think of this. This is just a different way of thinking. This isn't, I'm not dogmatic about this, but this is just some, something for you to chew on. I heard one man teach, and he believes that there are five horsemen. Who is it? Can you guess, just by reading Revelation 6, can you guess? No, look down in uh, verse number 8. Look and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. There's a fifth person mentioned. His name's Hell. Death and Hell followed with him. You say, well, his color of his horse isn't given. Well, not here. It's given somewhere else in your Bible. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter uh, 9. Ezekiel 9. I got all these notes and you can re-listen to this again. And um, Turn over to Ezekiel chapter 9. Just giving you a little meat. I've been kind of milky and syrupy. Amen. Every now and then it's good to get some meat. And this is going over your head. Stay around for the second service because it's more practical spiritual application. But I want to give you some of these things just to think on. What if there is a fifth horseman? It's not going to, it's not going to change a whole lot, but it's just something interesting to think of. And you can study these chapters on your own. Ezekiel 9 verse 1. He cried also in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. I, I've never seen this before until the brother showed it. But Behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate. Now this one has six people, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. They all have slaughter weapons. They're going to kill. One man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side, 
And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. The glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the chair whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And listen, he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn in his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst. And to the other five, those are the other five horsemen. Remember there were six mentioned. He said to the, the, the other five, Go after him through the city, after him. Remember Revelation chapter number 7, Hold off hurting the earth until after. He marks 144,000. Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have you pity. Slay utterly young and old, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any of, upon any man whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Begin there at the sanctuary. I'm not going to go through, but you have the sanctuary there, the seat of Satan. He's going to come up in the holy of holy place, make the, going to sit on top of the throne, all that. Anyways, you all can read that out on your own, study on your own, let me know what you think. Notice there are six horsemen. One of those horsemen has an inkhorn around the side. He's going to go and mark people's foreheads. And then he tells the other five horsemen, one, two, three, four, five, to go and destroy. So it looks like they're, whatever Ezekiel's seeing, he's seeing some type of a vision. And unless you have a better explanation of what it could be, and I'm, I'm open to other interpretations we can talk about afterwards, but he's saying there are six horsemen, and this, this one, the, the, uh, the, the one man is going to go, and he's going to set a mark on foreheads, turn over to... Uh, notice, by the way, that man with the inkhorn is clothed in, in, uh, with linen. You can cross-reference that with Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 uh, has a vision of Jesus and he's clothed in fine linen. Revelation 1 verses uh, 9 through 13 talks about Jesus Christ being clothed in fine linen. Um, look over in Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6. I'm not trying to lose you on purpose. I'm trying to show you, uh, I've sat through classes before for an hour and a half and I had no idea what the professor was saying. And the professor said, it's because it's such hard material, go back and listen to it again, take your notes and look back through them. Uh, and look back through them on your own. You have to study on your own. I can't give you everything that's in the Word of God, you have to go and find it on your own. I'm just giving you places to look at and think on. Just think on these things, that's all I'm asking you to do. I'm trying to get to show you how deep the Bible can be and how, uh, how much stuff there is in there. Look over in Zechariah 6, verse number 1. Zechariah 6, 1. I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out of between a, two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. Remember Zechariah 9? People were coming out of mountains. The first chariot were red horses. The second chariot, black horses. The third chariot, white horses. And the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. You can read the rest of that later on your own. How many horses were mentioned? How many different colors of horses? I don't know what grizzled they are. So they might be the same color, they might be different. Yeah. No, that's good. You have grizzled and you have bay, you have five colors. You have white mentioned, red, black, you have grizzled. Grizzled, if you look up the definition of it, it means uh, gray hair, light gray hair. The horse will have a lot of gray hairs going through it. It can kind of give it a pale appearance. Just look up the word grizzled. The other one that's mentioned there is bay, a bay horse is a chestnut color or red. It's honestly the color that you think of whenever you think of horses. It's a, the brownish red look. And they usually have black, uh, black hooves. It's a chestnut color or red or brownish red. Five colors mentioned over here in Zechariah 6. You have, you have a six men mentioned over in Ezekiel 9. One of them has an inkhorn getting ready to go out and mark people's, uh, uh, on their foreheads, the people that are crying out because of the abominations and the killing that's going on. Uh, and you have these different colors uh, mentioned. Zechariah 6 can maybe give us the color uh, to what hell uh, is writing. Notice it says that they were, the fourth chariot had grizzled and bay. So, again, I'm not trying to confuse you. I don't know if death and hell ride together or what. I know this. Revelation 20 says, Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. All men were judged, all the things written there in the book. Uh, death and hell gave up the dead were in them. And every man was judged according to his works. And, uh, and then at the very end it says, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell. Death and hell show up throughout your Bible together. And I can't explain it, I don't know why, uh, but it personifies the place, death and hell. And it makes it like they're a person. And uh, it says over there in 1 Corinthians that he became sin who knew no sin. It says he became sin, as in sin's a person. Romans 6, we talked about Romans 6, how it personifies sin and makes sin a person. If you are therefore dead to sin, don't be servants to sin. He personifies the, the, the 
the thing of sin, he personifies it. Um, it's something spooky to think of, but you know what an angel is? I'm, get, I'm trying to give you, is this interesting to anybody? Is it interesting to people? Okay. An angel is a representation of something. The angel of the Lord, that's a representation of God in heaven. You and I we, don't, I, we don't have time to get into this. Remember the churches over in the book of Revelation, how they all have an angel? To the angel of the church of Smyrna, say this, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Remember when our Jesus is talking about the little children and how if you offend all these little children, and he talks about an angel. It's where the Catholic church gets that we have a guardian angel watching over us. If you read some, those, those chapters and look at them a little more deeply, I believe up in heaven, we each have an angel representing us. When our God says to the angel of the church at Ephesus, let them know that they need to repent, they need to remember their first love, and they need to return back to some things. He tells it to that angel. That angel is representing the church at Ephesus down there on earth. God's up in heaven, and that angel is representing him. The church of Laodicea, he says, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou art neither hot nor cold. I will spew thee out of my mouth. He's talking to an angel there. He says, tell the church down there, angel, tell the church. Each church has a representation. I believe we may have representations up in heaven. That's one way that God might be able to see what's going on down here by up there. I know there's some deep stuff, but God has a, there's a, everything that goes on up in heaven, there's a picture of it down here and vice versa. So my thought is this, with death and hell, whenever he mentions death and hell, we're cast in the lake of fire. I don't think it's too far stretched to think death and hell may be literal beings. That whenever, on the great judgment day that happens, the same way Satan Lucifer is going to come and stand before God and he's going to be judged. And those angelic beings, those beings that fell with Lucifer are going to be judged. Uh, I think I could be wrong, but we may see someone come forward. He's going to say, death, come forward. And I don't know what death's going to look like. He might. Seriously. But it, it's a personification. Um, if I was to tell you that Columbus, what, what is this place we're in? Columbus? Why is it? Yeah, over in Arnoldsburg. But it was named after someone named Columbus, right? It's a place. But there's a person that actually represents Columbus. His name was Columbus. That's what it's named after. So you get the idea. I know it's kind of stretching some things, but you see, I'm just throwing this idea out there. This may, you know, I know it may be contrary to what the brethren believe. And I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not saying it's dogmatic. There may be five horsemen. And death and hell may ride together. And I don't know why, but it looks like they have two different color horses on their chariots. Jack Trick has them both riding the same horse and off to the side. Uh, Grace told me they could both be riding the same chariot there in uh, Zechariah 6. Um, I don't know. I don't know. And you say, Aaron, what does all that have to do with anything? How many of you, be honest, how many of you are thinking this right now? What in the world does that have to do with anything? I just wonder what we know. Right. Well, I mean, that, that's, I gave you a lot of information. I mean, I knew some people were very interested in, like, Kelsey Nairner or something. <laughs> we have a couple other smart people in here, but look, here's the thing. I just gave you a, bu a bunch of stuff. I want you to see, Paul says, it's in your Bible in Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Can someone read that verse for me? What does Romans chapter 11, verse 33 say? I'm going to bring it all together here at the end, and we'll, th we'll take for a break. But I just want you to get this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Amen. You know what Paul's going to do throughout all Romans? He's going to summarize it. I, I believe there's some type of summary that happens there in Romans 11. He's getting ready to lay out things. We'll, we'll talk about next week, but there's other things that are, he's going to talk about the Jews prophesying stuff that's coming. you got to get this. Your Bible is so full of things, deep things. I read that in Ezekiel 9 the first time through, and I thought, how did you get five horsemen and Jesus Christ coming after them with an inkhorn, marking people's foreheads? I never saw it before, but it does kind of resemble what happens over in Revelation 7 about a man, Jesus Christ, coming. Paul's a picture of the Jew in the tribulation. Jesus Christ is going to come and mark the believers, the remnant that still believe in that, that, look, the Antichrist is wrong. We reject him. We've made a mistake. We're going to follow Jesus Christ. They're going to flee to the mountains. Jesus Christ is going to come mark them, and then all hell is going to break loose, and that's going to be the great tribulation. Then the great tribulation kicks off. Before that time, it'll probably be a mock millennial reign. It'll probably be a lot of peace. But the point is this. Paul says, man, ain't God's book something? Ain't that crazy? I mean, ain't that stuff wild? And that's what Paul's saying. He goes, man, he goes, this is amazing. He goes, this stuff this is unbelievable. And I want you to get this. He's doing it all within the realm of talking about how God is still doing great things for the children of Israel. This is all to come, man. And we didn't even hit the surface of everything that's getting ready to happen. With the rapture of the church and the tribulation and the millennial reign, we just covered a little tiny bit. 
And you know what he's trying to say? He's saying if God has all that, this is what I'm saying, if God has all that planned for the Jews down the future, you don't think he has something planned for you and I? If God's doing all this for them, Pale horses, red horses, black horses. He's doing all this stuff. And he's got all these promises for them. He's going to mark their for He's And that's all there in the Bible. And it's deep stuff. He's doing all that for them. He has it all planned out, man. And it's in this book. And we only know a little tiny bit of it. You don't think that he has a plan for your life? And your children's life? And your grandkids' life? You think he's up there in heaven going, man, I don't know how I want to get them through their day. I didn't think of that. I got all this down, but man, how to wake up in the morning and have joy and peace in their hearts and lives? I don't have it figured out. Jesus, do you have it figured out, Holy Spirit? Does anybody have it figured out? No. Man, if God can orchestrate all this and do all this, you don't think He can give you victory over your sins? Amen. You don't think He can give you joy and hope and peace of mind? And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about how to help people in the next service at 3.30. We're going to talk about the paralytic man that was healed. But man, God is in control. That's why I want you, If you don't get anything else... If all this stuff just went over your head, get this. That's what Paul's saying. He's like, man, we're just scratching the surface. And God's not done with that Jew, and he's not done with you. And he's not done with the church either. God's still building a church. And we don't have all the answers. We don't have it all figured out of how we're going to pay for a building. We don't have it all figured out how we're going to build, build, get people in here. We don't, I don't have all the answers, and you don't have all the answers. But I know someone that does. Amen. I know someone that does. And whenever you can't fully understand God's ways and His methods, you can trust God's intentions. And God's intentions are always to bring His people, His remnant, through. And His intentions for you is good. And it's to bring you through. Whatever you're going to face down the road, it's to bring you through. And that's what I want you to get. We took a step out, and I tried narrowing it in for you to apply it. What we'll do now is I'll say a word of prayer. We'll take a break. We'll play some music. You can get coffee back there in the back. And we'll start up again here in 30 minutes. You can ask questions. But uh, I just want you to see a little bit of the things that are in the Word of God. Whenever you study things out and break them down, and uh, it's mind-blowing. And it's funny that you and I doubt God and whether or not He has our life figured out. But 